I listened to a podcast called You're Dead to Me about people from history. The presenter begins with a segment called So What Do You Know? where he tries to guess what we, the listeners, might know about the person featured in that episode. I wonder what do you know about Daniel? I imagine all of us would probably say something about a lion's den. Although, do you know why Daniel was put in the lion's den? Daniel had three friends, you may well know their names, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, better known of course as Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who were thrown into the fiery furnace. You may know Daniel as the other person in the Bible famous for interpreting dreams, the first being Joseph. Daniel interprets dreams for his king, Nebuchadnezzar. Finally, most of you will know the phrase, the writings on the wall, but did you know it comes from Daniel, who is called on to interpret some actual writing on an actual wall? How did I do? In around 600 BC, Jerusalem and the southern kingdom of Judah had been conquered by Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian armies. As we hear in verses 1 and 2 of our reading, God's temple had been ransacked and its treasures carried off to be stored in the temple in Babylon. The important people and ruling classes, which as verse 3 tells us included Daniel, were separated and shipped off to live across the Babylonian Empire. This was quite common in those days to stop rebellions. The prophets had been warning God's people for centuries that this would happen because the people had been turning away from God and worshipping idols. But they didn't listen. And so eventually God punished them by giving them what they wanted. He shipped them off to serve their foreign gods in a foreign land. To those in exile, it looked and felt as if God had abandoned his people. But as we shall see in the book of Daniel, that was far from the truth. God would rescue them one day. This exile was God's will for now, but not forever. And in the meantime, he would be at work in and through those who stayed faithful in exile. An iPhone and a firework were arrested on New Year's Eve. One was charged but the other was let off. At the beginning of the year, I made a resolution to lose 15 pounds, only 20 pounds more to go. For me, this new year so far has felt less like a new start and more like that line from The Who, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. We are still unable to meet our families and friends still unable to meet together for worship services, still unable to live our lives as we wish. We're facing some of the same things that Daniel did, only we are stuck in our homes, whereas he was taken away from his. And actually, much of what he faced was far worse. In verses four to seven, we see that along with other young men, he was forced to learn the Babylonian language and read Babylonian literature, forced to eat Babylonian food, even forced to use a Babylonian name. We call that brainwashing. Over three years, these young men were to be so assimilated into Babylon culture and life that they would forget their home and be good and loyal and faithful servants to their new Babylonian masters. Verses 1 to 7 go from bad to worse. They begin with Israel's national and religious defeat, then humiliation, then finally assimilation. The best of the ruling classes who might form the resistance or even a rebellion were called to serve a new king. As new starts go, this ain't a good one. But, but, one of the most important words you'll find in the Bible is but. 
It's a little word, but it usually marks an important shift in what's going on. And we have one of them here in Daniel 1 verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself. Like we often do at a new start or a new year, he made a new resolution. I thought I got lost on New Year's Eve this year, but then I found their old Lang sign. <laughs> it's terrible, that one, sorry. Some astronauts wanted to have a New Year's party on the moon, but they didn't plan it in time. I'm afraid they don't get any better. Let's hear instead what happened next to Daniel in verses 8 to 16. Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favour and compassion to Daniel, but he still said, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men of your age? The king would have my head. So Daniel said to his guard, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food. The guard agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. A diet of only vegetables and water. <sighs> I, I'm not sure which I'd find harder to give up completely, if I'm honest, meat or wine. But why did Daniel make his stand here? Eating meat and drinking wine was not forbidden by God. In, in fact, it's commanded. Perhaps it was to do with not eating pork, which was forbidden, or not eating meat sacrificed to idols in Babylonian temples. Well, maybe in part, but that doesn't explain the wine. And actually, often the vegetables were dedicated to the idols as well. I think it was like a fast, like fasting, having a daily reminder that they were different, that they didn't belong to the Babylonians, but to God. It was a way of holding on to their true identity even while their masters tried to brainwash them. It would have been easier to give in completely, but they wanted to stay faithful in exile and not lose sight of who they really were. I read this and I wonder, what would I have done? Would I have made that same resolution as Daniel? Would I have had the courage to stand up for my faith amid such pressure to conform? And yet, friends, we face a similar pressure to conform today in this country. We don't have the threat of punishment by death hanging over us, but in many ways, our culture is brainwashing us. Maybe it already has. We see and hear a constant drip, drip, drip of ideas about identity, about desire, about sex, about what's right and wrong, which are not godly, which do not come from God. And yet we in the church so often accept them as if they are gospel truth. And we even reject the Bible when it warns us that we are turning away from God. The exact same thing that God's people have always done. The exact thing which led to them being exiled in Daniel's time. But that's not right. Daniel was though. Daniel was different. He made a stand. He found a way of holding on to his identity in God in the face of the onslaught of Babylonian culture. So how can we? How can you hold on to your identity in Christ? How can you remind yourself every day of who you are to help you stand up instead of giving in? I'm not going to answer that. 
It's for you to think about this week. How can you remind yourself every day of who you are in Jesus? A retired man volunteered to entertain patients in hospitals and nursing homes. He went to one place with his portable keyboard, he told some jokes, sang some songs at patients' bedsides, and when he'd finished, he departed with a greeting and said, I hope you all get better. And one elderly gentleman replied as he left, I hope you do too. After three years of this, Daniel and his companions, well, I don't know how they felt, but verse 20 tells us that they ended up the best in the kingdom. Ten times better in wisdom and understanding than the rest. And what I love is that it had nothing to do with the training they received from their Babylonian masters. Verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. God honoured their courage, their faithfulness. When Daniel stood up for God, he found he wasn't on sinking sand, but on solid ground. The Babylonians thought they were brainwashing these Jewish leaders, but actually God was giving them gifts. Actually, God was preparing them for a life at the heart of the government of his people's enemies. Who's in charge? Well, it isn't Nebuchadnezzar. Even in the very heart of Babylon, the seat of this empire's power, God was at work through his faithful servants. Verse 21 ends this chapter with dynamite. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Cyrus was not Babylonian, but Persian. He conquered those who had conquered and humiliated Israel. Mighty Babylon has fallen, but God's servant continues. God's servant Daniel remained, Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar did not. This is a warning to God's enemies and an encouragement to God's people. This is the new hope contained in Daniel. The servants of God will simply out-endure the kingdoms of this age. The nations conspire and the people's plot in vain, it says in Psalm 2 verse 1. Why? Because God will endure. And so God calls his people to faithful endurance. And that's why this series is called Faithful in Exile. It's not about escape or insurrection, it's about being faithful in exile, living faithful lives in the world, holding on to our identity as God's children in the face of temptation and pressure to conform. Daniel had the courage to stand up, to hold on to who he was in God. How can we, how can you do the same? How can you remind yourself of who you are in Jesus every day? So that we can stay faithful to God rather than giving in to the world's way. Daniel resolved not to defile himself and Daniel remained. He remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. May we stand up, may we be faithful, and may we endure. Amen.